I've heard so many comments this week from people about the timeliness of our theme, and we certainly agree that it is timely, and our world is so secular and so focused on the here and the now, we're trying to get folks to focus on the, the there and the then, and Brother John D. Barry is going to help us do that tonight. He's well qualified to do so. Many people know him as the Tennessee State Representative for House District 90. Uh, others know him for work that he's done in television over the years, in years gone by, for his marketing and advertising and public relations prowess and expertise. But why we invited him, of course, here, and why I think you've come tonight to hear him if you knew already that he was going to be here is because he is a gospel preacher. He loves the Word of God. He preaches it with passion, with conviction, and uh, without apology. And we love him for that. He is uh, certainly someone that has endeared himself to us here at Forest Hill and at Memphis School of Preaching. And uh, we love him for all that he does. And we're looking forward to hearing this wonderful message, Covet Not This World's Vain Riches, our friend, our fellow preacher and fellow Christian, Brother John D. Berry. One of my fondest memories as a child, and I often talk about my childhood because I know I was very, very blessed. I know that who I am and what I am today, even as a preacher, Brother Clark, Brother Mosier, and all the wonderful preachers that I admire, Brother Taylor, and others throughout this audience, the great men who are in this audience tonight. I know that I am what I am because they made me listen, look, learn, and admire great men like these men, sitting down watching the Herald of Truth and others on television on Sundays and other times and going to Bible classes. I have many, many memories, but far because of what I have been taught and what I have been shown from the Word of God. Therefore, when I think about my childhood, I look back sometimes at some of those trivial days, some of those days that most folks say don't mean a whole lot between a father and a son, but mean everything between my dad and myself. And one of my fondest memories is that we would go fishing all the time. My daddy in Crockett County would hunt all over the county to find some fishing hole or a pond or a lake where they said the fish were biting. That's all they had to say. The fish were biting. We were in the station wagon going and hunting it. It didn't matter how far it was out in the forest or out in the woods or in some God forsaken place where if a snake or a bear or something got us, nobody would ever find us. But he would go and we would go hunting because the fish were, were biting. Uh, we would lay three or four hooks in the water. And we would sit there sometimes for hours upon hours, occasionally moving the hooks around, uh, trying to catch a fish to take home for my mama to fuss about when we got it there. <laughs> On those great days uh, when we found that they were biting and we were pulling them out as fast as we could put the hooks in. I remember this like it was yesterday because it was one of those teachable moments and my dad took that moment as a gospel preacher knowing that I wanted to preach the gospel and teaching me a lesson that a lot of us are talking about today, as Brother Clark said in this nation, at a time when excess, promiscuity, lasciviousness, and greed has taken over the landscape. And so I remember one day we pulled the fish out just as fast as we could pull them out. And Dad's standing there with a bluegill in his hand, and I'm saying, man, Daddy, the fish are hungry today. And he stopped me right there. He stopped, and with that bluegill in his hand, that big, fat, healthy fish, he said, look at this fish. He said, Nick, this fish is not hungry. This fish is greedy. 
And he said, if the fish wasn't greedy, you wouldn't catch them. And he said, we're not catching the content fish today. We are catching the greedy fish. And that taught me a lesson right then and there that, I, that has stayed with me, to, re, to re, remain with me uh, throughout my life because it made sense. When I looked out on that pun and I saw all the bugs and mosquito larvae and tadpoles and all kinds of seeds, God had put plenty of food in that little pun, that lake or wherever it was, for those fish. They weren't hungry. They were greedy, just like he said. And the little piece of bait that was changing color the longer it stayed in the water was nothing more than just a little morsel to seduce them from their safety to go after something and then they get caught. Because they were greedy and because they weren't content, we caught them, took them home, cooked them up and enjoyed them on our table. And so thank God for the greedy fish. But you know what? Our bait was, to, a lot of times we use artificial worms and artificial bait, and I'm sure there are some expert fishermen in the room today who probably can throw the fly and all this stuff and catch the fish. And the fact that the fish is healthy and strong and a strong swimmer and fight on your hook, it means that God has done his job in providing for this little creature that he created. When I go to, my, to the word of God, we, we think that this fish lost his life because he was enticed by something he did not need and which added nothing to his life <clears throat> or to his well-being. When I read the book of James, which is often believed to be one of the first books of the New Testament, if not one of the epistles, rather, if not the first, James talks about this in the gospel of common sense of the Proverbs of the New Testament, which is one of the nicknames that this book is given. James masterfully teaches about man in the same way daddy taught me that day about fish. James said there in the book of James, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. He said, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he of any man. For every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his lust and is enticed or to bait or accepts and takes the bait. Then when lust had conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. What better description can we see of what, uh, of what is happening in the marketplace today, where men and women are being entrapped and seduced to all types of lifestyles, desires, coveting those things that the world dangles in front of them, and they're going greedily after these things, only to their own destruction. And we see it happening each and every day all around us. And unfortunately, we see many of our children growing up in this culture that wants more and more and more and more. Nothing wrong with having what God blesses you with. God didn't ask you to walk around mourning and groaning and complaining when he blesses you. But God wants you to understand the difference between a blessing that he gives for your obedience and a reward that you think you got uh, for your power or your smarts or your intelligence or your proper investments. And too often we leave God out of the equation, which is why so many people covet so many things. We find ourselves, as I say often, and you've heard me say before, I know folks like this, they can't ever give to the church. They can't ever take care of their families. They can't ever invest in their futures. They can't take care of themselves because they're constantly spending money they don't have to buy stuff they don't need to impress people they don't even know. And when we look at this, there are, there are so many folks who conduct themselves in this particular fashion. When we go back in the scripture and we go to the beginning, we go back to the book of Genesis, God lets us know that man is a creature and only man was given free will, but he is a creation of God that was given free will, that was given intelligence, and then God gave us law. We've talked about it so many times. We've been taught our whole life that God made all the creatures. He gave them instinctive motivation 
But he gave man reason, logic, intelligence to make a choice, which is why the Bible is usually written where man in, in comparative language, the Bible presents the blessings and the Bible presents the curses because only man has the free will and the intelligence to make that choice. The devil understands your wiring. He understands our desires. He understands our weaknesses. And he also understands that we're constantly wanting whatever it is that maybe even God has withheld in our own mind. We're constantly desiring those things that we tell ourselves and convince ourselves that we don't have. For this reason, the devil, when he came to Eve, the hook was to make her covet what God had forbidden. God had said everything. You're the richest woman ever to live. You own the whole earth. You are the most wealthiest that will ever live. No one will ever be as wealthy as Eve. Because God gave her everything, gave her dominion, and said of everything that I have created, there is only one prohibition. Don't bother the tree. Don't eat of my tree, the one tree that sits. I'm going to put it in the middle of the garden so that you don't have any mistake and say, well, God, I, it was all among those other trees and I just mistake. No, I'm going to put it in the middle of the garden, the tree that is in the midst. Don't eat of that tree. The devil understood us well enough to know that with our big brain, our intelligence, and the greediness that lies in there, if it's manipulated just right, to make us act against our own best interests. Because the devil is a usurper. He doesn't have any power over you. He's a liar, a seducer, a manipulator. And he has to make that covetousness, that greed, that lust, that desire, he has to make it grow within us so he can sit back and laugh at us as we self-destruct and commit spiritual suicide doing what we absolutely knew we shouldn't have done. And Eve knew it. She quoted God's law, didn't she? She said, God told us, if you don't mind me paraphrasing, that of every tree in the garden, she said there in Genesis chapter 3, that everything we can eat except the tree that is in the midst. Then the devil comes back with the hook. He comes with the hook in verses 5. The devil says, let me tell you something that God won't tell you. Let me show you something that God won't show you. Let me give you something that God won't give you. Let me reveal something that God won't reveal to you. Let me bless you with something that God won't bless you with. Let me take you somewhere God won't take you. Let me give something to your family. Let me lift you up somewhere where God won't lift you up. He gets in our head with that foolishness and make us sell gold for ten. And that's what he's done over and over and over in mankind's history. So he says to Eve, God doesn't know that in the day you eat thereof that your eyes shall be open and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. But better translation, as God, knowing good and evil. Basically what he said, let me appeal to your ambition, your desire, your pride, your lust, your desire. You know you covet being like God. You know you covet the power you've seen and, and the fact that you can have everything and be everything that God is. The Bible goes on to say, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. It appealed to her desire and covetousness began. And it was pleasant to the eyes. The same Hebrew word used there in, uh, in, in, the, as, as in Exodus chapter 20 and verses 17 in the law. It is a tree to be coveted. It is a tree to be desired. And basically from that point on, human history has gone all the way until a young man by the name of Jesus Christ on top of a mountain, half dead, half starved, with the most diabolical evil and liar that has ever been by himself at his weakest moment, 
is the only one who refused to fall to the devil's trap of lust. And Jesus was the only one until Jesus. The devil had a perfect record until Jesus came. So therefore we see that the command to covet, the not covet rather, the command to not covet is a command that shows that God has always been concerned about your heart. Many of us like to, to separate the Old Testament and the New Testament in saying, well, in the Old Testament, it was about marrying and doing the do's and don't doing the don'ts and dotting I's and crossing T's. But in the New Testament, God says, if a man look upon a woman, so therefore in the New Testament, God looks at the heart. Well, that's true, but God looked at the heart in the Old Testament also. The fact that God said don't covet meant that God has the ability even then and let them know. How would God know you're coveting if he couldn't look within your heart? This is why when the man of God went to Jesse's house looking for a successor to Saul, and he looked at all those young men that Israel coveted the same way they coveted Saul. They chose their king and they chose Saul because he was pretty, he was beautiful, he was tall, he was statuesque. He represents us in our greatness, our beauty, and our majesty. But God said, y'all's king messed up. He disobeyed me. And I'm going to remove him. I'm going to remove his family. And so when the prophet went down looking for another one just like the other one, God says, no, y'all chose that king so you could have a king just like everybody else. And that's what you had, a king just like everybody else. I want something different. The same thing that God wants from us as Christians. He don't want folks just like everybody else. Act like just everybody else. Walk like, live like, talk like, desire like, lust like, covet like everybody else. God wants something different. And he demonstrated his ability to look within the man. Because when each of Jesse's boys are being paraded before the prophet and he's lacking everything he saw. Oh, this one. God said, no, what about that one? God said, no, well, here's another one. God said, I reject them all and send him out to David. You know the story. And he told him, let me tell you what I do. You look on the outward appearance. You're looking at what's shiny, the bright lights. You're looking at those things that make you look like a big shot. You're looking at those things that bring you the pleasures of the world. You are looking at those things that set you among men to be admired and to be lifted up in awe. God says, but I look at the heart. I'm looking within this man, and this is the one. This ruddy little shepherd is the one that I'm making king. You make him king this moment. Because God knew the heart of David and liked what he saw. Jesus had to help a young man out one time who didn't realize that he was caught in covetousness and that he loved the things of this world more than he loved God. He walked in the way I see many young men do today, and it bothers me. And I bet you a dollar gets a bullfrog, like my Papa Stalin used to say, that it bothers a whole lot of the pre older preachers. When I see young men styling and smiling and profiling because of what you think you know and what you think you can do, and because you're lifted up in pride about whatever it is you believe you are, you need to get yourselves down to where God wants you to be. Because in his teaching, one time the Lord said in Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verses 16, continuing through verses 22, where the Lord said this young man came and wanted to know what good thing, what great deed can I perform to inherit eternal life? Can't you see him strutting before the Lord in his Imani toka? Can't you see him when he pulls his Cadillac chariot up there for everybody to see? Can't you see this young man being like many of the young men and women that we know today in academia, in the professional world, in corporate America, and Lord have mercy even in the church who lift themselves up 
above that which is written. The Lord said, I'm going to help you today. I'm going to help you keep the law. The Lord is baiting him, knowing he's going to, what he's going to say, because the Lord knoweth the heart. Keep the law. He says, man, this stuff I've done since I was a child. Give me something hard to do. All this stuff, I've kept all these laws. I am perfect in the law. The Lord said, okay, if you want to be perfect, you want to be as big a shot as you think you are in your own head. He says, sell. Get rid of all that stuff that you covet. Get rid of all that stuff that you love. Get rid of all that stuff that you've hoarded. Get rid of all that stuff that you worship. Get rid of that idol God that you got all hoarded up and give it away to the poor and then come follow me and you want to impress me that's what you can do and the bible says that this young man walked away sorrowful you know why because he was caught in covetousness and coveting the things of this world and loving the things of this world and like many of us too blind to see his own condition the Lord stood on the mountain one time, that obscure mountain that the Bible doesn't even give it a name. But he stood there in front of the Sea of Galilee with the natural acoustics of the sea behind him. And Jesus spoke the greatest message that has ever been spoken upon this earth. The greatest sermon that has ever been preached. We call it the Sermon on the Mountain. My Lord and my Savior, during that discourse of that great sermon gave some of the great advice against covetousness against lust and inordinate desire that man has ever been given the lord said to you there in verses 19 through 21 lay not up for yourselves treasures treasures on earth where moth and rust that corrupt and thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt nor thieves break through and steal. The Lord says, because let me tell you something, where your treasure is, what you covet, that's where your heart is also. You may think your heart is with me, but your heart may be in your bank account, in your treasury bills, in your stock holdings in your address your home your vehicle your children your cottage in other words where your treasure is and too often we treasure the things of this world of this world more than the things of God when the apostle Paul was teaching Timothy and teaching Titus Paul is in a maritime prison Titus is in Crete, Timothy, I believe, is in Ephesus, and the apostle Paul writes to them. He says to them in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, if my memory serves me right, he says, but godliness, godliness with contentment, with contentment is great gain. Problem with many of us during the course of our life, we are never content. We are never content. It doesn't matter what God gives us. It doesn't matter how good he is to us. It doesn't matter how much he's blessed us. We are never content. Some folks don't understand what contentment is. Well, you know, contentment is when your cows don't come home, you just leave it alone. No, that's not it. When your ship don't rise, when your ship don't come in, no, that's not it. Contentment is I named it, but I can't claim it. No, that's not contentment either. Contentment is when I have done everything I can and I am supposed to do. You don't sit down on the seat of do nothing, lean back on the elbows of do less and be content. That's not contentment. That's sorriness. That's laziness. That's what they, that's trifling, as my daddy used to call it. You are content when you've done everything you can, everything you're supposed to do. Then you turn it over to God who can do everything you cannot do. When I know I've given it my best, when I know I've worked hard, when I know I've tried to take care of my family, I've tried to take care of the Lord's church, when I know I've tried to be obedient, then I can turn it over to the Lord and be content. Paul went on to say to the brethren in verses 7, 
And something that many of us seem to lose sight of as that greed jumps all over us when they play these commercials and they've got these beautiful cars. Nothing wrong with a car. Work and get you one. Don't sit back and greedily lose your soul because you haven't done what God told you to do in order to be blessed. The Lord said, seek ye first. You put me first. Seek ye First, you put my word first. Seek ye first. You take care of your family. Seek ye first. You preach my word. You stand for my word. You do what I commanded you to do. You seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. I feel like the old man David felt. As I get older and I look back, I have to shake my head and say, that's nothing but the Lord. Nothing but the Lord. I am 66 years old and I've never had a hungry day. Never not had a roof over my head. Never not had at least enough money to take care of my family. Don't you realize that, when, that God always takes care of his children? David said one time, I have been young. You know the scriptures. I've been young. He says, I am now old. But David said, didn't he say, Brother Taylor, I have never, never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God takes care of his children. He takes care of his children and those that worry and covet and envy and jealous about stuff, worrying all the time about things that God has promised who our Lord, our God, our Father, who says, I will never leave you. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. He says, you brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that you would take nothing out. And Paul goes on to say something that makes a whole lot of sense. He said, having food and remnant or covering, let us be there with content. When God put food on the inside of you and put some clothes on the outside of you, say thank you, Jesus, and go on about your business. And stop sitting around whining about what you don't have. The problem with some of us is we never get to that point to where we can say that's enough. I got enough. I got enough. Because there'll always be somebody with a house bigger than yours, a car more expensive than yours. I'm not one of those persons you got to walk around showing you got some other dude's name on your clothes. You know? <laughs> Don't mean nothing to me. What, what I care about that? The fact of the matter is, Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verses 5, Paul said, let your moderation, your moderation be known unto all men that the Lord is at hand, that the Lord's taking care of me. Paul said, be careful for nothing. Stop worrying. You're a Christian. You're never supposed to look worried. You're a Christian. You're God's child. Do you have faith? Do you or don't you? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Where does that faith come? You all know the scriptures. It comes by hearing and trusting in the word of God. When I trust God's word, when I accept him at his word, when I follow his word, when I embrace his word, I don't covet because I've got enough. I've got what God gave me when I do what God told me to do. Paul said, be careful for nothing but in everything. Notice what he said. By prayer and supplication, ask God to supply. How are you going to, you, you too proud to ask God? And then you're going to fuss when you didn't get it? What's wrong with that picture? He said, in supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known unto God. Here is what the world does to us. The world makes us covet those things by making us love possessions and pleasure and prestige and position and power and promiscuity. All of these things are all around us and they will sicken us and drown us 
if we don't watch ourselves. Solomon is often called the laboratory of human experience because he had a little bit or a lot of everything. More gold, more silver, more bronze, more houses, palaces, lakes, swimming pools, women, horses, more of everything to this man is uniquely qualified to say what he says to us. Vanity, vain, vanity, vain, vanity, vain, vanity, 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 says the preacher. Vexation of spirit, all is vanity. He says it's empty, it's worthless. When you spend your whole life accumulating stuff, God told the man who he had given stuff, who lost sight of what, who gave it to him and why he gave it to him. He's sitting around bragging, saying, look at what I got. Look at me. Look at me. I'm going to tear down my old barns. I'm going to build me some new enclosures, some new barns, and I will say to me, you know, it's a problem when you start talking to yourself. I will say to me, so lay back at ease, eat, drink, be merry, have a good time. You know, I'm paraphrasing. Have a good time. Enjoy what you have accumulated and amassed. You've earned this, boy. You've earned this. You've worked hard, boy. Didn't nobody do nothing for you. You pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. Well, you know, the great provider of all things to all people took offense to that. The Bible says he came to him that night and said, fool, what you call me? Fool. <laughs> fool. This night, this night, your soul shall be required of thee. Then tell me something, fool. Who shall these things be? Who gonna get this stuff when you gone? You've heard me say before, all of us gonna leave this world and turn into a yard sale because we can't take any of this stuff with us. And God let Peter tell us that all of this stuff is going to be dissolved. Why in the world would I understand that I'm just passing through? I'm just passing through. We've lost all of, well, many of our loved ones, haven't we? We've lost those who we thought we couldn't breathe without them. But God let us know we're just passing through. This is not your home. This is not their home. You're just passing through. He says you're pilgrims and you're sojourners in this world. What is your life, James said, but a vapor that appeared for a moment, just a moment, just a moment. And it vanishes away, a flower that blossoms for just a moment, just a moment. And then it withers away. But did you blossom? During the course of that life, did you blossom? Because that's what God wants to know of each of us. Did you blossom? Paul said one time to the brethren, not that I speak in respect of want or because I want something from you. Paul said, but let me tell you something I've learned. And we're talking about the same guy who was arrogant, who persecuted the church, who probably had great clothing and a beautiful home and a prestigious family. He was one of the most educated men of the ancient world. Paul said, I have learned. I have learned. You know what I've learned? I've learned a lot of the stuff I thought I needed, I didn't need. A lot of the stuff I couldn't live without, I can live without it. A lot of the stuff I thought would make me a big shot didn't make me a big shot. A lot of the stuff I thought would make me happy didn't make me happy. My mother used to say when I would ask her questions about stuff as, you know, you look at old people, and we used to call them old, now I'm old. We used to call them old people, and they didn't worry about nothing. They, my dear would look at us and say, just keep on living. Just keep on living. And I've kept on living. God's let me keep on living. And therefore, I understand that much of the time we spend in our life amassing and accumulating and trying to climb the ladder and fighting and scratching. I'm not telling you to go home and sit down. 
Solomon says, think of the ant. Consider the ant sluggard. Don't be a sluggard. That's not what he's talking about. But when you think about the fact that there are so many of us who think we can't be happy unless we've got a whole lot of stuff. And God's busy telling us that the stuff won't bring you happiness. Paul says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith be content, be content. I've learned this. I have learned this, Paul says. Paul went on to say, as he talked to the brethren in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 8, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I might win Christ. Paul says, everything I had to give up, Anything I had to give up, it was worthless to me. Therefore, in chapter 4 and verses 12, Paul gives me some good advice. And I've had to turn to that advice many times during the course of my life. When I find myself losing sight of what's important, of what's real, of what's relevant, of what's eternal, and not the things of this world that are fleeting and will go away. Paul says, I know both. I know both. I know how to abound. I know how to be disciplined in prosperity. And I know how, uh, and, 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 uh, and all things instructed both to be full and to be hungry. I know how to abound. I know how to be abased. I know how to have discipline in poverty. In essence, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and 27, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. Lest that while I teach and preach to others, I myself shall be a castaway. I buffet. I make myself act right. Paul is saying to the brethren in Galatians chapter 6, verses 8, Paul said, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit shall reap life everlasting. I told you the story once. My, we came to Memphis from Crockett County, Alamo, to the fair. I told my folks the story, Brother Smith, over at Coleman Avenue. And me and Herschel, my good friend, we had cut lawns, chopped cotton, picked cotton, baled hay. We had a pocket full of money. And we had our straw hat on, our red band line shirt, our half deck, which is half overalls, our convert shoes and red socks. We are ready to conquer the world. And we came to the fairground and the first tent we get to, man called out, hey, young men, y'all some fine looking young men. Oh, he had his thing down. We walk up there to the tent and he put an Elgin watch right there in front of me. My eyes got big as a half dollar and my brain as small as a peanut <laughs> as I looked at that Elgin watch. And I wanted that watch so bad, he started me out with some type of game that started with a dollar. Then it went to five, then to 10. Before you knew it, me and Herschel both were flat broke and we hadn't even gotten the fare yet. And I didn't even have the Elgin watch to show for it. You know why? Because that greed jumped all over me, and I just told myself how good I would look with that Elgin watch on my arm when I went back to school on Monday. And the devil took advantage of me the way he takes advantage of all of us. Let me leave you with something here. John told us, he said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. John said, all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. He says, don't love this stuff, and, and these are the things that will destroy you because these don't bring you close to the Father. John wanted us to realize that that's the devil's trifecta, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the vanities that happen to us during the course of our life. Paul said in 1 Timothy 6 and verses 9, but they that will be rich, he says, desire a covet richness, fall into temptation and a snare 
and into many foolish and hurtful or harmful lusts. I like this next word he uses, which drown men in destruction and perdition, ruin. They ruin men. How many men have been ruined because they lost sight of where their blessings come from and they lost sight of who their Savior is and they lost sight of what true riches are. My Lord and my Savior came to this world. The Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Philippians how the Lord emptied himself. He was rich, but he became poor for our sake. Jesus came to this world, became a man, and he suffered all. He gave his life. He was born in that stable, wrapped in swaddling clothing, and laid in a feeding trough in a manger. He grew up being called the carpenter's son and eventually the carpenter. Jesus was the one that at 12 years old demonstrated what he was supposed to be as a man. He grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor of God and in favor of man. Jesus walked and John baptized him in the water, not because he was a sinner, but because everything prophesied had to be fulfilled. Jesus came from the water, was tempted by the devil, was tried and tested over and over and over again. Jesus is the one who could call the angels from heaven if he so desired. When he prayed, the scariest moment in human history is when he asked God three times, do I have to die for these people? For these people? These folks who have talked about me my whole life, talked about my mother, talked about me my whole life, and now they're getting ready to condemn me and take my life. God's plan was that he, that he would die, and Jesus died for our sins. He accepted. He accepted our punishment. He became the perpetuation of our sins. You've heard me say before, and I will say it again tonight before I sit down, because it's important to this discussion, this germane to what we're thinking about. When God looked on that cross, you've heard this gospel, the greatest story ever told about the greatest life ever lived. When God looked at that cross, that middle cross, you believe this story because you know it is the truth. And without faith, you can't please God. And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You look at that middle cross and there was a man who stood for you and was nailed to that cross for us between two thieves. When God looked at that cross, he looked at our substitute, our perpetuation. When he looked at the cross, he saw you. When Jesus comes back and he looks at us, he better see Jesus. You've heard what is right. You know what is right. You know you need to change your life if you're not living right. And if you're not a member of the church, repent. Acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. Go into that water. Mortify your old man. Anything dead needs burying. Bury the old man. Stand up again, which is what resurrection means. Stand up again to walk in the newness of life. God's been too good for to us here in America. I walked through Kroger's the other day and it frightened me. I saw so much food, so much abundance. And I know in my heart that while I was walking through there, that there was some child somewhere starving to death. There was some mother that couldn't feed their children. But God's been good to us. To whom much is given, much is required. Let's not keep talking about what we got to fight with and forget what we got to fight for. Understand who you are, why you are, and whose you are. Love your Lord, serve your Lord, not the things of this world. If you've fallen away, repent. Come home tonight. Come home. Don't leave here unless you get things right with the Lord. Think about it. Hold on,